last time i think i was dealing with the eighth mantra yes and eighth mantra over and we are also in the we did just briefly dealt with the ninth and tenth mantras these mantras have got one special characteristic they have been interpreted differently by different philosophical schools shankaracharya of the advaita tradition interpreted in one way the manijites and the followers of the vishishta advaita tradition and also dwaitins the followers of the madhva school and in later times in the 20th century aravindu gave his own interpretation when you read all these interpretations one may be struck by, by a special characteristic of this upanishad what it exactly is the real meaning of this or the implication of these verses so by way of explaining this i shall make a few important remarks in fact the upanishad gives a road map it gives a, the picture of the evolution of a man's spiritual and philosophical progress now depending upon our own evolution our own attitude towards our life our own individual life and our, our attitude and approach was a world at large external world and our concept of god these three are interrelated so when you look upon the text from this standpoint we can we, we have to uh, go back to swami ji's interpretation swami ji's analysis of a man's spiritual progress where he says then one begins his spiritual journey with the dualistic approach and moves through the non the qualified non dualistic or vishishta advaitic tradition and ultimately culminates in advaitic or monistic realization this is what swami ji said that in that context swami ji says we are not moving from error to truth but rather from truth that's lower towards truth that's higher there is no such thing as an error in fact by error we mean incomplete or partial understanding of truth so the dualistic and qualified non dualistic approaches imply the first two stages of a man's spiritual progress and the advaitic realization implies the ultimate or the the zenith of one spiritual and philosophical evolution now there are two terms used here that you find a vidya and avidya these are very commonly used in vedantic tradition vidya normally means knowledge and avidya means ignorance this is the general understanding avidya can also mean maya in the sense it's due to our ignorance that we think that this world is absolutely real when we get rid of this ignorance we understand this world is only relative and maya implies relative avidya also implies the relative now vidya the word vidya is interpreted differently in two different ways in this upanishad in one context vidya implies knowledge but knowledge of the relative let us say say a man who uh, or a person who thinks this world is real 
or the relative knowledge is real, so science, technology, and all other branches of learning related to the empirical life, phenomenal life, which help us to lead a comfortable life, which help us to conquer the forces of nature and turn these forces of nature into tools in our hands with which we increase our comforts and make our life uh, more happy in an external sense, in a purely empirical sense. This is one sense in which the vid word vidya is to be taken in this Upanishad. This only in a relative sense. In the absolute sense, vidya means the knowledge of the supreme reality, the knowledge of the supreme consciousness, the knowledge of Atman or Self, which takes us across the ocean of ignorance, ocean of samsara. You may come across certain words in the translations of this Upanishad. I have just used one sentence, ocean of samsara. Samsara means world, ocean of world. I didn't, you know, or going beyond life and death. Such terms you find in these words. Vinasena murtyum tirtua, such word you find. Svidya amrdam asnuti, such expressions you find in this Upanishad. Now what is the implication of crossing the ocean of samsara? It needs a little explanation. Samsara in literary, in literary sense means that which uh, comes and goes. Samsara ti iti samsara. That which flows. That which is changing. That which is not eternal. Which is peripheral. Which is phenomenal or which is empirical. Relative. That's what is meant by samsara. It doesn't imply the world alone. The world is changing, but it also implies the phenomenon of human life. And it is related to the theory of rebirth, or theory of reincarnation, and the law of karma. In Vedantic tradition, an individual soul goes on moving from life to life. Like, just imagine a cycle or a wheel, in fact. In fact, the word is samsara chakra. Means. Chakra means wheel. There's a wheel of the cycle of human life and death. Now, whatever we do, thinking that this world is real, we do with attachment. We do with, a, with a, an element of selfishness. This action, it may, the, the action need not necessarily be physical action. It may be verbal action, speaking. It may be mental action, thinking. Or it may be physical action also, of course. So any of these actions done uh, with the deliberation, with the identification that I am doing this, will be based on another mental process, thinking process. I want to enjoy the result of this action. I am the doer of this action and I am the enjoyer of this action. Any such action, verbal, mental or physical, will leave its mark, its impact in our mind. And then we will, our character also will be formed by these actions. If you read Swamiji's Karma Yoga lectures, you can get a very beautiful description. Swamiji gives an elaborate description, karma and its effect on human character and so on. All these lectures are fine. So whatever we do, we leave its mark in our mind. The word mind is sometimes called chittam in the, in the, in the traditional vocabulary. So, and if that action produces good result, we will have a tendency, we will be tempted to do it again and again, even if that's not necessary. If that action produces unpleasant result, 
then we may try to avoid it even if that action is very important and very necessary. So this action influences our character, forms our character. And based on this and based on these actions, character is formed and depending upon the action, depending upon the character, our action also will be uh, formed. So actions constitute character and character influences action. And then accordingly we when we die our our mind will be will be influenced by the totality of all the actions that we have done whatever thoughts actions or words we have spoken a gist of this will come to our mind when we die that is a even gita even yam yam I don't want to quote too many things. See, Krishna tells Arjuna, see, whatever may be the thought with which you die, accordingly you will be reborn and your action will be accordingly. I can uh, uh, emphasize this point uh, by giving a small narration based on the Bhagavata Purana. And the first book is called First Skanta. This story, I won't go into details. Parikshit was a great king. It so happened that he committed a terrible crime or a sin by mistake, not willingly. As a result, he got a curse that he will live only for seven days. At the end of the seventh day, he will die and will be he will he will be killed by snake bite. That was the curse he got. And then he was a wise man. He gave up his kingdom, his royal palace, went into the banks of Ganga and started doing tapasya. He, he understood there are the, the, maybe the only seven days are left, seven into 24 hours. So that much only. I don't want to waste my time. A normal man, if you are told, if a man is told, well, you are going to live only for one month, then also he'll be terrified. But Parikshit was a wise man. Because he had done a lot of good holy deeds in his life. So he decided that he will live as a saint for the last seven days of his life. And he went to the banks of Ganga. So all the great sages of that age, that, that, those, that, that time came to know of this episode. They all came to the banks of Ganga to see Parishit, this great king. Of them, there was one great sage. He was named as Shuka. And Shuka is the teacher in the Bhagavata Purana. Shuka is the son of the great Vyasa who classified the four Vedas and is the author of the all the Puranas. Just when Shuka himself arrived, Parikshit was overjoyed. The, great, the greatest sage of that, those times, arrived right in front of him. So he puts a question to this great sage. The question is, now I would like to ask you one question. What should a dying man do? What should a dying man meditate upon? What should be his thoughts? How, how should one face death? Atha prachami samsiddhim yoginam paramam gurum purusha seha yadkaryam vriyamanasya sarvadha. This is that Sanskrit verse. The literal translation is this. No, I am going to ask you one question. You are the greatest yogi of this age. And then he goes on asking questions. See, whom should I meditate? What should be my thoughts? What should be my action? And what is the best way, the most intelligent way to face death. And if one can master the technique of death, he can also master the technique of life. Because people do wrong things because they forget the reality of death. They somehow, though they are seeing death taking place all around them every day, every moment, still 
there is an internal conviction and that is what is called that is the power of maya or illusion delusion that life is eternal and this misconception leads a man to wrong deeds and wrong thoughts and wrong actions so this great text teaches us that death is a great teacher of the mystery of human life and the mystery of human death also and the answer is given in the next book next section of the purana second skanda it is called first chapter the um uh, shuka gives the gist of the answer in one shloka of course the answer is more elaborate because shuka asked a few more questions what should a dying man do and what he should not do both questions he asked that is the last part of his question please tell me what a dying man should not do now i am going i am not going to all those details but i i shall give the gist of the answer shuka gives the answer etavan sankha yoga bhyam sudharma parinishthaya janma labha para pumsam ante narayana smriti the answer is ante means in the end at the end of life when we breathe our last at the time of death one should remember god this is the goal of human life this is possible three alternate paths are prescribed by this great sage one through the path of yoga karma yoga jnana yoga bhakti yoga and so so through the through or through ashtanga yoga or through advaitic vichara means the advaitic path of uh, discriminate discrimination between the real and uh, unreal everything else everything else other than atman is unreal atman or self consciousness the supreme reality is the only reality everything else is uh, unreal in the sense only relative this is the second path the third path is perform all our actions with a sense of surrender to god surrendering the fruits of action to god the results of action to god because we are normally not attached to actions we are actually attached only to results of action so this is the prescription given, given by the great sage and then so he says and ante narayana smriti means when one is breathing his last he should remember he should be able to remember god if any path enables you any mode of life any path of life enables you to die with god with the thought of god in your mind the holy name in your hearts then that is the best way to die that's a question that means that's answer given to the question put put to the great sage by the emperor means what should a dying man do what should be his thoughts what should be his actions now in all these three parts one important point is uh, to be remembered we have to live in this world but we should never take the world as, as as the supreme reality as a goal in itself as an end in itself it is a means it's a tool but at the same time it should never be taken as a supreme end in itself this is the gist of the answer given by this great sage the whole purana it's called bhagavata purana the greatest of the 18 scriptures called the puranas this is the gist of that great work and the entire book is nothing but an exposition of this idea how to die with uh, the thought of god in our hearts that is the subject now in this context one may ask the question how to uh how to develop this conviction this uh, the, the the this uh, understanding that god 
is the only reality and everything else is uh, only relatively real or they are only relative. There are scriptures, including the Upanishads, explain three levels of a man's understanding of the world. A primitive man who has not spiritually evolved at all thinks that the world is real. The material world is real. A very, very primitive man. A scientist will not, uh, will not tell you that the world as we see is uh, real. He may, he may tell you that, well, it cannot be real as you see it because it is changing. But he may not be convinced of the reality of the Supreme Consciousness or Self or Atman. That's a different matter. But he'll be fully convinced uh, of the unreality of the relative world in which he lives. There's no doubt about it. So, at the primitive stage, a man thinks the world as he perceives around him is real. At the next stage, he comes to the conclusion when he uses his intelligence and his intellect, he comes to the conclusion that the world as we see around and as we experience around cannot be real as it is, but we can't say it is unreal, so it is unsaid. It is uh, indescribable. In Sanskrit, it is called anirvachaniya. That is the second stage of man's understanding of the world, according to Vedanta philosophy. The first, he thinks the world is real as it is. At the second stage, he thinks the world cannot be real because no intelligent man, no educated man will be foolish enough to say that the world as we see around is real assets. Because real means remaining without any change. The world is certainly not that. At the third stage, he comes to the conclusion that there is something beyond this world something that we cannot pursue and that alone is real and everything else is real only in a relative sense. So, the so at the beginning he thinks the world is real, at the second stage he thinks it is indescribable, at the third stage he thinks it is only relative. Relative means mithya or ma. These are the three levels of a man understanding of the world. Depending upon this, he uh, conceives his idea of God as well. At the beginning, a man uh, may think that God is one who creates this world and sits apart from this world and supervises this world. That that idea is not wrong. Vedanta doesn't say any idea is wrong. Vedanta says, but this is only a partial understanding. At the second stage, he thinks this world is created by a God who is, not, who is an abstract ideal, who cannot be known, who cannot be pursued. And at the third stage, he understands God is the supreme reality and there is nothing other than God and God is only all-pervading, omniscient and immanent and transcendent reality and we are in essence non-different from that God. means we are uh, just uh, different expressions of that inner spirit. This is the, this is, this is the road map to towards the highest concept of God and also to the most, towards the most scientific understanding of the world. So this should be understood here. So as I said, first the, the word avidya is mentioned by, mean, by, by which the Upanishad means ignorance. Then vidya is mentioned and this word vidya is to be interpreted in two different ways. In the relative sense, vidya means understanding of this world, the secular knowledge. And in the absolute sense, vidya means the real supreme knowledge of the self or atman or the supreme consciousness. This much if you keep in mind, then these three 
four slokas will become very very clear because these slokas are a bit abstract <coughs> now uh, i have already explained uh, this uh, this ninth sloka antham tama pravishandi ye avidyam upasate so the mantra means this those who pursue the path of avidya ignorance mechanical action without any concept of the transcendental without even the concept of a god with form who creates his world such people enter the world of darkness antham tama pravishanti they enter the world of darkness then those who think that the supreme reality is those who limit the supreme reality to the level of a minor deity who answers your prayers for material benefits alone they enter a world which is much more dark because their progress for i mean their the road to further progress is permanently blocked so a man who has no idea at all you can give him you can teach him a man who is who is fully convinced of a wrong conclusion who is who is who is obsessed with a wrong conclusion is difficult to teach him so that's why such people enter a world which is even darker than the earlier world then then the same word is used in the 10th mantra അന്യ ദേവാഹു വിദ്യയ അന്യദാഹു അവിദ്യ ഇതി ശുശ്രുമധീരാണ് ഏ നസ്ത വിജചക്ഷിരെ ഐ വിൽ റീഡ് ദി ഗ്രോസ് ഓർഡർ വിദ്യയ വിദ്യ മീൻസ് ദ റിസൾട്ട് ഓഫ് വിദ്യ ദ റിസൾട്ട് ഓഫ് സുപ്രീം നോളജ് ദ വിദ്യ സ്റ്റാൻഡ്സ് ഫോർ സുപ്രീം നോളജ് ഇൻ ദിസ് മന്ത്ര ഐ ടോൾഡ് യു ഇൻ ദി വെരി ബിഗിനിങ് ഉപനിഷത്സ് present a serious difficulty in terms of the language used in explaining high philosophical truths so upanishads were framed at a time and in an age when language was in its, in a state of infancy it be it's the sanskrit that's used in the upanishadic literature is very very archaic it was it, it, it is a language which uh, We, we, in which there was no definite uh, rules of grammar in fact the famous grammarian panini is name lived in the 7th or 8th century bc before christ and upanishads uh, were upanishads must have been formed around 3000 4000 years before panini that means or almost uh, 6000 years or 7000 years earlier so the standardization of sanskrit grammar and the rules and regulations took place almost 3000 years be uh, 3000 years after these upanishads uh, came into existence that's why language is highly fluid archaic so sometimes they had to use the same word to mean different things very often in the same stanza or the same sentence i will, those who, those who are interested in sanskrit grammar will be surprised and uh, the famous there is a famous statement uh, by a great interpreter commentator of the first uh, important work in the world on etymology it called ashtadhyayi means a work with eight, eight chapters that's the standard book of sanskrit grammar by panini so and before that there was another book yaskas nirukta that also was there yaskas nirukta was little earlier but yaskas just took a few verses about less than 500 uh, couplets from rigvedam rigveda samhita and gave interpretation of the of some of the terms used in those mantras and rigveda samhita contains uh, more than 10000 Uh, rigs means small the smallest unit of rigveda samhita more than 10000 almost 11000 between 10000 and 11000 and yaska uh, the great uh, 
commentator of the Veda Mantras, first commentator. He inter he explains only around less than 500 of them. Just imagine. And there is a famous commentary by Durga Charya. There he says, "Pravaktu ko vividhya prakarana vividhya cha asya arthasya anena bhavida." I am going to those details. They are not relevant, but just give an idea of the. Problem of language in the Upanishad literature. So I'm giving. So this great commentator says the meaning of the word in the Vedic literature has to be interpreted according to the context and also according to the person who uses it in at the time of chanting or recitation. So it means it was highly fluid. The language had not become a standardized uh, grammatical structure. It did not have a standardized grammatical structure. When the Upanishads were written, that's why the same word can mean different things, not only in this, not only in, in, a, in a text, in a book, but also in each mantra. In each, sometimes the same sentence uses the same word in two different uh, meanings. So that's a, that's a problem. Okay, good. So anya deva ahu vidya anya ahu avidya. Idi susrama dhiranam ye nastad vichakshire. Here vidya. Vidya, according to absolute, absolutist philosophers, means the knowledge of the supreme consciousness. But there were ritualists in ancient India who used these mantras to perform external rituals. They used to pray to different deities, different gods and goddesses for empirical worldly pleasures. According to them, this, month, this Vidya will take you to Surga. Vidya Devaloka means Varga, according to them. But according to a philosopher, according to a true spirit, true seeker of truth, this Vidya is that learning which takes a man beyond the cycle of life and death, which I mentioned earlier, and beyond uh, all that is relative. That is the real sense in which the word Vidya is to be taken, according to Monistic philosophers. So, that's meaning. So, Vidya Anya Deva Ahu Avidya Anya Deva. So, the result of Vidya is one thing and the result of Avidya is something else. This is the opinion of the great sages of the ancient times. Ye Naha Tad Vijachakshire Tesham dhiranam iti. Now, we have heard this from the great sages who have taught us the supreme truth. What, is, what was their teaching? The result of ignorance, the result of ignorance of the self is one thing. What is that? The end, moving through this cycle, this wheel of endless life, death and rebirth and the game continues eternally. Till one realizes, till one stands apart and asks the question, who am I? Is, this, is there nothing beyond this life of actions, sufferings, enjoyment, again actions, and then death, again rebirth, Again, the same uh, the, the repetition of the same cycle. Is there nothing beyond this? Am I just a, a helpless board tossed about by the mighty waves of this cycle, this mighty wheel? Just an insignificant creature which is forced to move along with this cycle, mighty endless cycle of life and death. Is there nothing beyond this? Only a philosopher or a spiritual aspirant can ask this question. Till one seriously starts this inquiry, this cycle continues. That is the result of avidya. And vidya is the, what is the result of vidya? Vidya is the result of coming, is the result of uh, true spiritual inquiry. And as a result of vidya, you come out of this cycle. And Vedantic tradition prescribes three important paths 
for coming out of this cycle raja yoga karma yoga bhakti yoga and of course jnana yoga jnana yoga is not a path as such it is a supreme realization so as a result of this yoga traya one can come to real jnana so sometimes the jnana is also included in that case becomes four yoga other is called yoga traya the easiest path or the easiest and most simple manifestation of this vidya is karma yoga the karma which binds us today which binds us to this world becomes a tool that breaks these chains that is the science of that is a technique of karma yoga normally whatever we do with selfishness and attachments i am the doer i am the enjoyer of the results of my actions whatever we do verbal action physical action or mental action in the form of thoughts whatever may be these actions bind us to this world as i said earlier it leaves a it leaves a mark in the mind and accordingly we had to be born to perform the action you find certain people are born certain with certain strong characteristics they can't behave they can't help behaving in a particular manner there is an inherent or innate behavior patterns we can't help it no psychologist can explain it in the vedanta it sometimes called prakriti prakriti swabhava gita says or anusuta swabhava bhagavata purana says certain behavior patterns which are which are inborn uh, which are congenital which we can't help it so ami ji in one referring to this swami vegananda says we 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 are good because we can't help it we are bad because we can't help it because whatever we do today is a continuation of what we have been doing in the previous life or earlier what we have done in this life say after 10th year or 8th or 10th year we may remember with name and form whatever we have done in previous life remember we remember only as an abstract idea because name and form were perceived by indriyas by senses by the eyes of things we will forget but we will get only abstract idea certain abstract ideas we can find manifesting or exp- being expressed in our mind certain inherent behavior patterns the residue of previous actions in previous life so previous actions belonging to previous life are remembered just as abstract ideas or innate behavior patterns or characteristics and memories related to this life are remembered with name and also with form their idea remember memory becomes more vivid and more clear so here uh, the the upanishad says anya deva ahu vidyaya the result of vidya is different from the result of avidya the result of avidya as i said earlier eternal chains eternal bondage whatever we do becomes a chain that binds us to this world so we become helpless boats in the mighty ocean of worldly life but these very actions are turned into tools for breaking these chains that is the science of karma yoga so ami ji explains in the karma yoga lectures the actions that we normally perform with selfishness with a motive behind can be and should be performed without a motive without any selfish desire then these actions slowly become instruments for breaking the chains of bondage this is the one way to come out of this mighty wheel created by avidya another path is jnana yoga if one can strongly convince himself i am the atman i am different i am not this body i am not i am not an enjoyer of this worldly pleasures or earthly things i am not a helpless tool in the hands of a merciless 
destiny or fate. If one can convince oneself, then one can come out of it. But it needs a strong will. Swamiji says only Buddha could do that, only Shankara could do that. Then there is another path, that is Bhakti Yoga. If one can do everything and surrender everything, the feet of a God, of an idea of God, maybe any God, in any religion, when an idea of God is a great help in spiritual life, A creator God. If one, if, one may, if one can surrender oneself and one's actions to the almighty God, then that also helps one to come out of this mighty wheel. The fourth path is Ashtanga Yoga. Not a Yoga Asana, please remember that. Yoga, Hatha Yoga is only one aspect of this science of yoga. Yoga is nothing but Chitta Vurti. Chitta Vritti Nirodha means complete, complete cessation of all mental impressions. But it's a, it, it, it's a, it is a result of a prolonged process. Through this one can come out of this way. So the technique of coming out of this way is Vidya. And the helpless condition of being bound to this mighty wheel of the cycle of life and death. That is a result of Avidya. That is what this mantra this verse implies. So, the result of Vidya is different from the result of Avidya. This is what the great sages of ancient times have taught us. Then the next sloka, Vidyamcha Avidyamcha Yastad Veda Ubhayam Saka Avidya Amrtim Tiyatva Vidya Amrtam Asmiti So, one who practices Vidya and Avidya, this is a reference to what a normal man should try to practice in his daily life. That's, meant, that's what is meant here. Avidya here means daily actions. Avidya here stands for daily actions. Because daily actions, normally what a man does in daily life, it creates bondage and bondage is a result of Avidya. That's the relationship between actions and Avidya. And Vidya. Vidya here stands for meditation. Meditation on a personal deity is one sense. A meditation of the supreme being is another sense. If one can combine both, it takes us across the ocean of the endless cycle of life and death. This also has been explained earlier. Today, we have to take up the I mean, the twelfth mantra. We have already dealt with this mantra. Nine, tenth, and eleventh have been dealt with last, last Wednesday. Antham tama pravishandi ye asambhuti mupasate tado bhuya ivate tamo tamo yau sambhutiyam rata. This mantra. I should explain. Ye asambhuti mupasate te Antham tamaha pravishanti ye u sambhutyam ritaha te tataha bhuya iva tama pravishanti. Sometimes you know the Upanishad repeats the same idea in a different language using different terms and terminology. That's so here you find the idea is repeated. In a vague sense. Now, in ancient times, there were people who used to worship God in various forms. One important uh, book is called Mandrika Kariga. It is a book, uh, 215 verses by Godapada. It's a commentary on the Mandrika Upanishad. Mandukya Upanishad contains only 12, 12 verses. And Mandukya Kariga is a commentary in metrical form uh, written by Gaudapada, a, a great Advaita teacher who lived almost 200 years before Shankaracharya, who wrote a commentary in metrical form called Kariga on Mandukya Upanishad. There, Gaudapada refers to 
almost 32 different schools of thought prevalent during his age. 32 different concepts of ultimate reality. So people, there were people who 